so much fun with all these kids. We're tossing balloons. We've got Twister and Jenga, and we're playing bowling with toilet paper and tennis balls, and it's just a great time. So make sure that you're here next month for Family Day. Speaking of Family Day, I wanted to take just a moment and invite you all to Family Day which our next one will be Thursday evening, March the 7th. Again, that's Thursday evening, Mar Thursday evening March the 7th. It is going to be sponsored by the Global Vision Freedom Network, and we are excited. We are going to bring to our church Global Vision's Got Talent. <laughs> so we've got the judges picked out. Pastor Ty, somebody told me you're going to be a judge. So Pastor Ty is going to be a judge. Ms. Georgia Brown is going to be a judge. we got a couple others. And I want to introduce my co-host to you. Kiara Clark will be the MC of the evening. It'll thank you, everybody. I'm actually the main talent, so the main thank talent, you. Yeah. Make sure you're there. It's going to be great. So we're going to have hub leaders from across the country joining us in-house for this and as well as a conference we have coming up. So we're excited to have them integrated with the church family. I want to mention this, and then we're going to turn it over to worship here in a moment. If you have a talent, and we've already got some funny stuff that's been tur turned, it turned into us. But if you have a talent, maybe singing, maybe it's a unique talent that nobody knows, whatever. What I need you to do is, if you want to be a part of the talent night, we have 20 slots to fill out. And I need you to email a 30-second video audition. All right? I need you to email a 30-second video describing your talent and or you demonstrating your talent. And that video needs to be sent to the following email. I'm going to give you the email, so please write it down if you're interested in participating. It is jordan at globalvisionbc.com. Again, that is jordan at globalvisionbc.com. And send us an email. Send Jordan an email with your talent, and we will put you on the list. So it's going to be a great night, family fun, friendly. i got stuff planned for the kids as well. So join us for that. We are so excited. The video audition has to be turned in by Monday, March the 4th. Again, that is Monday, March the 4th. And then that evening on March the 7th, we're going to have the competition. We're also going to have pulled pork. So we're going to have fresh barbecue, fresh smoked bologna, and a lot of homemade sides to go along with it. So dinner will start at 6 o'clock. And then the competition, the fun competition, will start right after dinner around 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Thank you, Kiara. I'm literally so excited for that. I just want to go ahead and, and let all the contestants know you're lucky I'm not in it. I would definitely win first place. Yeah. So you're welcome. I bowed out gracefully to let everybody else have a chance. You can thank me after service. No, I'm just kidding. Um, one last really serious special announcement. Um, we are upgrading, I guess, our flag ministry. And so Miss Kim Sanders, Miss Kim, can you stand up and wave your flags? <laughs> so Miss Kim, over here she is taking over the flag ministry if you have a heart that burns for worship you need to be here under the tent this thursday night at 6 p.m this thursday night at 6 p.m miss kim is going to be doing our very first flag ministry class i am so excited i will definitely be there so i want to see you guys there and let's burn for worship um speaking of worship georgia georgia are you ready we're live we're live <laughs> Okay, guys, let's get ready to worship. Welcome Hallelujah. to church, guys. Good morning, church. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. Well, it's time to stand to your feet and to give him the praise that he deserves this morning. Because there's no one else who is worthy. May he rest upon us, Lord. That is our prayer. That is our cry. That you would descend and your spirit would just continually rest upon us, Lord. Oh, how we love you. We enter your gates with praise and we enter your courts with thanksgiving this morning. We lay everything else aside, all the sin that so easily entangles, and we look forth towards you, Lord God, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. God, we love you and we trust you and we praise you. It is all for your glory and all for your honor.
I want our ushers to go ahead and just today we're going to have a, a come forward time in our giving. And so just want you to come and place these on the altar up here on the platform. We're going to sing a little bit more today and we're going to get into the Word. The Word's always important here. It's always supreme. And some messages are uh, maybe evidently heavier than others. Today there is a, a holy heaviness upon me and upon the message that's going to be taught and preached for a little while. And so we're just worshiping to prepare our hearts and our minds for what the Lord has for us. I want to remind everyone that's here that at 4 o'clock this afternoon, from 4 to 6, uh, we have just an absolute uh, 
a barrage number of people that ask us on a weekly and sometimes daily basis here at the church and they call how can we get involved how can we serve how can we volunteer how can we step into our uh, role and the gift that the holy spirit has for us so today from four o'clock to six o'clock in the tent we are going to have a day in which you can understand serving and volunteering here at the church. And so we have a volunteer opportunity evening, all right? And so that's going to be a 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And uh, Pastor uh, Greenwells, the Greenwell, they're going to be here, and they're going to take care of that tonight. And so it's going to be a great time. You don't want to miss out on the fellowship, but more than that, you don't want to miss out on an opportunity of, hey, how can I roll up my sleeves and literally work for the kingdom and through the conduit of our local church. And so from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, they're going to be doing that serve day, that volunteer opportunity evening. And so make sure that you are here for that. Even if you can just come for a little while and you can't stay for the entirety of the two-hour duration, please come and please be a part. And we'll be doing these on a regular basis uh, so that people can know how they can better serve, how you can get connected, how you can be equipped uh, to serve the body of Christ here in the local church. Because I'm here to tell you, Regardless of what the culture says, there is still one organism that God has given authority to, and that is the local New Testament church. And the local church is important to Jesus, therefore it should be important to us. Amen? And so be here from 4 to 6 sometime during that duration and uh, know how you can volunteer and how you can step into your gifts today. Now, just before we pray <clears throat> and we go into our offering, which we do right in the middle of worship on purpose because we believe giving is a massive form of worship. And uh, that's why a lot of times we don't pass buckets, right? We'll just put them down front because the Bible says on the first day of the week, you bring your tithes and your offerings. You don't just haphazardly throw them into a bucket because you just feel like tipping God a $20 bill. And so I believe in making an effort to give to the work of the Lord. And so that's what I want you to do here in a few moments. But I wanna to talk to you about the offering before I pray and before I release you into doing that. And we'll, we'll let some of our worshipers kind of clear the path so we can part the Red Sea a little bit and let you get up here. And it's amazing to me, you know, we say very little about offerings around here just because God's going to take care of all the needs and we give 80% of the money away anyhow. But it's amazing to me how sometimes, you know, people feel kind of awkward and you'll be like, oh, are we going to have an offering? And, and uh, you know, just a handful of people start moving around. No, look, I'm telling you, what you're going to find out today Jesus didn't shed all his blood because he wants 10% of your money. Hmm? Stop being stingy with God. Because we're going to give an account of that. I am, you are, the church is. And so I, I don't do these Ponzi schemes, get rich quick schemes, have to sell a bunch of stuff and market a bunch of stuff. If you don't give because God has wonderfully changed your heart, I wonder if he's wonderfully changed your heart. The, the, the Bible says, you know what stewardship is? You know what giving is? 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, it is the proof of your love. You know the only time the Bible says the proof of my love is, is giving? So, you can get sideways about that. If you're offended now, you wait 30 minutes. And it'll be a different kind of offense. Hmm? You're not going to be politically offended today. But some of your Sunday school upbringing is going to be shattered today because it's theological nonsense. Some of your ideas and pictures that we have in our mind, our flannel graph days, have ruined us. We have such a weak, anemic, comfortable idea of what Jesus did for us. And the reason we do so little for him is because we've been taught since Sunday school that he really has just done so little for us. A couple little blows to the mouth, loose tooth, a couple little scars, cat of nine tails. I'm going to dismantle that whole nonsense. You better stick around. If you get easily offended and squeamish, you should leave during prayer. And I'm not apologizing. God never called me to pastor a bunch of sissies that are comfortable lukewarm. Never. Praise God, this is just the offering I'm about ready to take out. But we got to be faithful with what God's given us. we got to honor Him. And so the Bible says that we bring our gifts. Now listen, 
I'm going to do something that, I don't know, there'll be three or four people, maybe, that when I say it, will kind of be like, don't do that. All right, I'll obey the Holy Ghost, not the whims of men. Now, obviously, we're going to take our offering. We have a lot of expenses. Man, we've been putting out so much money for these ridiculous lawsuits that we're still in. We, we've, we've got some ornate plans. You ought to see the plans we got. We got the best looking plans of any church without a building you've ever seen in your whole life. We've paid tens of thousands of dollars for site plans and all of this. And, and, and it's relieving a lot with the county. And I thank God for that. It's, it's a blessing. We're doing our best to be as compliant as we possibly can. And so we have a lot of expenses. And uh, we have our missionaries that we want to help and we want to bless. But one of the things I want to do today with a percentage of the offering... And this person doesn't even go to our church anymore. So they have no idea that I'm going to do this. But I want to be able to take like $5,000 today from our offering in-house and online. And uh, some of you know uh, by now. And look, I, I don't want to hear, well, they left the church. I don't care. I don't care. We either offer love and forgiveness to people or we don't, right? And obviously... He reached out because he knows there's people here that love him and going to pray for him, right? But last night, uh, Paul Coy's wife had a brain aneurysm. And uh, she's passed this morning. And so they're, uh, as of just before church service, uh, they were doing a, a donor walk in the hospital because, you know, they're uh, getting ready to just utilize she was an organ donor utilize what she can uh, what they can to save other people's lives and that's admirable that's honorable and so obviously he's mortified and and devastated and you know you, you, you don't there, there's something you, you have stinking thinking if when I said that the first thing is well you have you seen Facebook have you seen what they I don't even care. We're going to help this man pay for his wife's funeral. Okay? And he don't ever have to come back. That's on him. I told him he's, all, he's welcome here. He's welcome here. There's, a, there's, a, there's only a small fragment of people that we said, if when you leave, you're not ever able to come back, right? Small, fra tiny, little, insignificant fragment. rest of them, they all come back. But when I heard that last night, my wife and I were out and we were on a date. And it's just, you know, that's, that's, that's devastating. That really, I mean, that's, that's beyond devastating. And he's already gone through a lot already. And so as part of the offering, and he, he has no idea. He just, he just reached out for prayer, not asking for money. But I know he's been going through just a, a hard time, work and house expenses. And not regular things that we have. But uh, she had a, a, you know, just aneurysm. Nobody expects that. And so she is in the arms of the Lord this morning, right? And so, but he needs the arms of the Lord and people that can come around him and just love him during a difficult time, regardless of, of things that happened in the past and debates and all that. Who cares about all that stuff? Big deal. Your death's a great unifier. Now you better hug your friends. You better hug your family. And somebody's going to eulogize you one day, right? And guess what? All that stuff that you thought was a big deal won't be a big deal when they're gone. You better love them while you can. Let me, let me tell you, husband, something. Dead noses smell no roses. Huh? You better buy them while she's alive. You better love them kids while you can. So we're going to have our, just our regular offering today, but as part of that, I want to be able to take a percentage out, $5,000. And I want to bless him. I want to help him. And I know he's going to have a lot of expenses. And I don't know what all expenses, but I, I, I know we can at least do that. No matter how much we've got that we have on our plate, we want to bless him. We want to help him. And we want to honor him. We want to let him know, hey, we love you. No matter what, we love you. And we're going to stand with you and your family during this time of bereavement, during this difficult time. And we'll get, you know, information in the coming hours and days on, you know, what arrangement looks like and all of that. And, uh, and we'll go and we'll show up and we'll be a blessing to him. And we'll hug him and we'll let him know how much we love him and his family. And we'll support him because that's what the body of Christ does. That's what the body of Christ does. So, Lord, bless the offering today. Lord, you know we have insurmountable 
things that are against the church right now that, that most people would have no idea. And, and an average church perhaps would just be like, holy smokes, there is no way. Just close up. But Lord, you just meet every need. No matter how big it is, you always part the waters of the Red Sea. You make a way when there is no way. You give us daily bread. We don't need monthly bread. It would mold. We just need it every day. So, Lord, give us meat that we know not of. And I pray you'd bless this offering in-house and online and all of our hub leaders and everybody watching today scattered hither and yon all over the nation. Even the people watching right now and watching later for the wrong reasons. Captivate their heart. Convict them, Holy Ghost. Show them they need Jesus. And so I pray that you'd bless this offering. I pray that you'd help uh, Brother Paul during this very difficult, unexpected, unusual time. And his, his family, his kids, Lord, all of it. It's a lot to process in just a short amount of time. It just happens so quick. And such is life. It happens quick. If we live to be 100 It'll be a drop in the bucket in comparison to eternity. No matter where we spend it. So God help us to be ready. And help us to live and long to live our lives so that other people are ready. So Lord I pray that you just bless all the needs we know about. All the needs that we don't. And then Lord just help our folks to just come forward and give so that we can bless this man in this difficult time. And Lord we know that as we give. It'll be given back, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom, for with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Luke 6, 38. We know that to be facts. That's not hypothetical. That's not just think about it and make, no, no, no. No hope so, think so. That's a fact. If we are generous with what you've entrusted us with, you will generously entrust us with more because you know we'll use it wisely. So do that, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And the church shouted out. All right, if you're not standing, go ahead and stand. Most of you are, but let's lift our hands and our hearts. Let's make a little bit of a wave. we got four or five buckets on either side. Just begin to come forward. We're going to continue to press in in our time of worship before we get into the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. But I want you to just begin to come right now. If you're making a check out, just make it to GV or Global Vision, whatever. We'll make sure that out of that expense check, we give him just one uh, check that will bless him and his family during this time. So let's worship in our singing, worship in our praying, worship in our fellowship, and let's certainly worship in our giving today. Come forward and let's honor the Lord.
search all the world and there would be none but you there would only be you oh God the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world the blood that poured out for us oh father today we just want to know you we want to know you and we want to know you crucified oh God Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you that there is none worthy. There is none worthy but you, O oh God. Lord, we lift your name on high. Father, we lift up your name on high in this place. The Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the righteous one, the Son of Man, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon. You are our good shepherd. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Oh God, we just lift up your name in this house today, Jesus. You are Yeshua HaMashiach. You are the way to the Father, the one and the only way to the Father. And Lord, we thank you that your blood poured out for us. Lord, that the veil was torn, that we could boldly enter into the throne of grace. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood. There's truly no one worthy but you. There's no one worthy but you, oh Lord. We bring to you the highest praise. We break open an alabaster box of praise, Lord, and we say that you're the only one that is worthy. You're the only one that is worthy. And when we count the cost, oh God, we still rise up and say you're the only one
one who's worthy. Who else is worthy? There's none like you. There's no one like our God. You are high and lifted up. There's no one like our God. There's no one like our God. We just speak your name in this place today, King Jesus. Be lifted on high. Be exalted in this place, oh God. Oh Lord, we worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The one who was and is and is to come. The bright morning star. You're our groomsman, 
Give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. You can return to your seat. You can be seated all over the house. I want to invite you to actually several places, but I'm going to take my time. I'm going to seemingly work backwards in the message a little bit. I have to be honest. I'm just going to as any preacher should at any moment, fully and completely and teetotally rely on just the leadership of the Holy Spirit of when and what to say, because this is one of those messages where there's a lot of biblical information that I want to share and that I don't want to miss, but I also don't want to overload people, and I also don't want to get behind or out ahead of the Holy Ghost. And so I, I just, I'm going to take my time I'll be excited because that's just who I am, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dial my personality out of it. I'm going to slow down. I want to teach you some stuff. I want you to see that the truth of the Word of God is what's going to radically, dramatically change your life today. Nothing else. We're going to use the Bible. So the first place that I want you to go today is John, the 19th chapter. Would you go there with me? 
John chapter 19. It would do you well to mark some things today. We don't have a formal outline, but the Word of God will outline things for us. I'm going to give you some quotes. I don't often do that. And I've got some things just written here in my notes. It's superbly unusual for me to uh, have my phone or have, you know, like written down statements and quotes and things. But I don't want to miss out on some things that I've been studying that the Lord has downloaded into my heart, into my mind, and my spirit. And I want you to get the full weight of it and the full context of it over the course of the next little bit. So here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask a few things. I'm going to ask that today you pay closer attention than you've paid in a very long time. Not because Greg Locke's preaching, but because this is important. I'm going to ask that you be as distraction-free as you possibly can. And I'm going to ask that if you have to use the restroom, please either go now or use it at points in the message that people don't think you're so mad you're leaving. Okay, does that make sense? And I, I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, I, I know that's funny. <laughs> Especially if you know the context of me and our, our history together. But it's not that kind of mad. Okay? It's not that kind of mad. I, I just want to talk for a minute before I, I pray and before I get things rolling. Okay? Because I think it's important as your shepherd that you understand my heart uh, in regards to this. If you have a television, and all of us do, if you have an iPhone or an Android, a computer, an iPad, a smartphone of some sort, and, and so many of us do, then you have exposure to levels of things that are far more descriptive, graphic, and offensive than what I'm going to talk about. So I want you to be careful today not to get sideways about the graphic nature of what I'm going to talk about and then be hypocritically going home addicted to horror movies. Hmm? But which you shouldn't be watching anyhow because you'll open yourself up to demonism. I can promise you that. Straight up witchcraft. So it's amazing to me that Christians will say to preachers that are just gun barrel straight like me and dr and others they'll be like ah, i just don't think you ought to explain it like that it's a little bit too graphic and then you go home and you watch saw movies right i don't think you ought to talk about that from a biblical standpoint and your heroes are like jason Voorhees, freddy krueger and michael myers i don't want to hear it i don't want to hear it we're exposed to so much in social media, we become desensitized. And when a preacher lifts the lid on something that makes people uncomfortable, people are like, well, I just don't think you ought to talk about those kind of things in church. The church is in the mess she's in right now because we've refused to talk about these things in church. That's the facts. And I'm talking about something that we know about, for the most part, randomly. But I, I must confess that in continual study of what I believe the Lord wants me to share with you, the gospel of Jesus has been so effectively watered down that no wonder people have a level of lukewarm that is nauseating to God and should be nauseating to us because we just have this idea that Jesus died this simple death a couple thousand years ago out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, he rose again from the dead. Whoopee. D. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. There is nothing more powerful than the gospel. But I must remind you, book of Galatians, there is nothing more offensive than the truth and the New Testament presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I just want to captivate your hearts using the Bible. We're going to preach a little and cry a lot. Because I just feel like it. So Lord, help me.
Lord, I don't even know how to, how to start. I want to convey it well, but I want to convey it right. So Lord, I don't care how long it takes. Settle us. Don't let us ever leave the same after today. Don't let our online audience, our hubs, hub leaders, atheists watching, Satanists watching, religionists watching, followers, lovers, and haters watching. Don't let any of us hear the word of God today and be same old, same old, humdrum, lukewarm Christians. So do a work today, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. And the church shouted out. In a moment, I'm going to bring you to John chapter 19. But I want to remind you that the night of the arrest of Jesus, he was in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. I used to say that that was a special trip. And although it turned out to be a special occasion, if you'll read the book of Mark, it says it is a place that he and his disciples resorted to on a number of occasions. Jesus went there often to pray. That's why to them it was just another simplistic random time of Jesus spending time with his father. But this night was different. Judas was going to betray him with a kiss. And the Bible tells us as we looked at this past Wednesday night that the disciples in the moment were enraged and Peter pulled out a sword and chopped off Malchus's ear and Jesus healed him and what a, what a beautiful passage that is but as you back into it here's what you see the Bible says that Jesus tells his disciples I want you to watch and pray for an hour you ever tried to pray for an hour Jesus just told Peter six and a half verses earlier you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, that's all wash. I'll die for you. I'll take a bullet. I'll lay on a sword before I'll run away from you. And six and a half verses later, he couldn't even stay awake for an hour and pray. So don't tell me that you will die for someone that you don't willingly and daily live for that same someone. Can I get a witness? But the Bible says that Jesus came to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of pressing. And it says that he was in great heaviness. And the King James says, agony. And he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. By the way, he was not looking for an easy way out of the cross. He dreaded what was going to happen when the wrath of God was poured out without mixture upon him. And he did not just die for, but became the sin of the world. Because he that knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And you will notate, as we will see in a moment, that Jesus is going to transition from saying, Father, 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 Father. He called his Father just that the whole time of his ministry except one time. Did you know Jesus only called his Father God one time? Just once. Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only time he ever called him God. You know why? Because in that moment, theologically and historically, Jesus had no father. Jesus had a judge. And for the only time in universal history, the Trinity severed itself as God the Father and God the Holy Ghost, hence my God, my God, turned their back on God the Son and the Bible says and darkness fell over all the earth until the ninth hour and we got all these weak anemic expressions 
of a sissy looking man on a cross with three spots of ketchup coming out of his side and we wonder why the church is not moved to serve him because we've never truly understood the sacrificial depths that Jesus went for us that's why the Bible says that it is our reasonable service Romans 12 1 and 2 Buford Bledsoe's life verses it's our reasonable service why because he gave all for us why would you give less than all back to him Jesus gave it all not because he wanted your leftovers and we live the life of leftovers that we give to the Lord and you know it's the case and it'll be quiet today and that's cool thanks be. so Jesus before John 19 happens he has this encounter with his father in the garden and the Bible says that he sweat as it were great drops of blood I began to study that and I've done a lot of not just historical but medical stories studying over what I want to talk about over the next little bit today and it'll be a little bit medically that is called hematidrosis big fancy word it's only happened historically verifiably in medical history less than five times that we know of and one of them is in the garden hematidrosis is a medical phenomenon that happens when someone is mentally and emotionally under such distress they are in such vile agony that literally the pressure from the inside will burst the blood capillaries mix with the sweat and come out of the pores of your skin and this is before Pilate Herod and the high priest crucified him this is just in the garden and as he is sweating before his father he is literally exuding blood through his sweat pores from his skin as he pours himself out as an offering to God before he pours himself out as an offering for you so they arrest him he's tossed around all night look at verse 1 chapter 19 John then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him please circle that word all the gospels mention it Matthew scourged him Mark scourged him Luke scourged and chastised him John describes it a little deeper they scourged him and the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe that was the purpose of mockery by the way we know that through all the context purple was a symbolization of royalty then and now and they began to mock him and said hail king of the Jews and they smote him with their hands Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them behold I bring him forth to you pulls him out on the terrace so everybody can see him that ye may know that I find no fault in him and his wife had already said you better have nothing to do with this just man I had a dream about him and I've tore up from the floor up about it and you better not touch him this is a just man but watch this verse 5 then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate saith unto them watch this behold the man exclamation point now I don't have to read into the Bible something that's not there so I can read out of the Bible something that was never intended to be there but I can plainly read the Bible this scourging in fact was so brutal so vile so vicious so violent so beyond anything that Hollywood could ever imagine that I believe in the context of the statement of Pilate before he sets Barabbas free turns Jesus loose not just to be scourged but the Bible says scourged for the purpose of now being crucified because he had washed his hands of him 
And they said, oh, that's okay. His blood be on us and on our children's children. And if you've ever wondered why the Jews have caught so much hell over the last 2,000 years, it's because they put a curse on themselves and said, his blood be on us and our children's children. And until Jesus comes again, that curse will remain on them because of that, that word that they spoke right there. But Pilate brings Jesus out fully believing in his political puppeteering mindset that what he had just endured he just endured it. We'll explain it in a moment. He just went through it. The scourging. All four Gospels tell us what it was. All four. He brought him out. And I believe in my heart that he honest to goodness thought that when they saw him that the people would say, Wow, holy smokes, that's enough. Let this blasphemer go. But they didn't. And when Pilate said, Behold the man. I believe in essence what he was truly saying in the text was, Behold what is left of a man. And we have so been damaged by our little pictures that we hang on our wall. Our little graven images of a fake silly sissy Jesus an Americanized Jesus a westernized white hippie on a cross nonsense what blasphemy we've taught the church what blasphemy we've taught the church just this little weak anemic emaciated man crimped up on a cross inconvenience for six hours on a Friday so you could keep looking at porn and robbing God and talking garbage to your spouse and going to church once a month and tipping God 20 bucks because after all you're surrendered to Jesus and Pilate said behold what's left of this man but it wasn't enough for the people. They were bloodthirsty demons. Mongrels. When the chief priest, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die. This man is worthy of death. This man's committed blasphemy. By the way, if you've been reading the Bible, the law says he committed blasphemy. Kill him. But man, they went from stoning to crucifying. Because you see, Jesus is not now being scourged by the Jewish people. He was scourged by the Roman governor and then turned over to be crucified by the Jewish people. Does that make sense? Keep that in your mind. That's important. Because in the Bible, even the Apostle Paul talked about the times that he received 40 stripes save one. That's strange, King James talk. What it means is, if you went beyond the 40, you broke the law. You couldn't beat the person beyond 40 stripes. So instead of 40, they would call it 40 save one, which would be 39 stripes. So just in case there was a miscount, they would back off one in the count so that they would not go 40 and beyond. Does that make sense? Call it 39 stripes. That's the Jewish law. It's in the Bible. Romans had no such law. Romans didn't follow the Mosaic teachings. Romans would beat a man without mercy as long as they felt like, depending on the amount of damage they wanted to inflict on the person. Now, I want to read you a couple things. This is crazy stuff. We got plenty of Bible to go. Josephus, one of the greatest Jewish historians of the world. I'm talking about out of the Bible historical framework references. Josephus. He noted that certain rebel Jews were torn to pieces by the scourge before they were crucified. So he said in the Jewish war. 
Roman historian Livy says, and I quote, the Romans employed scourging as a torture or a punishment to extract information or testimony from dissenters. Romans inflicted scourging on those that would not recant, on slaves or prisoners for withholding governmental information and on criminals who had been condemned to death by crucifixion. Sometimes, continue quote, the victim died before the scourging was finished. Scourging sometimes led to the death of the condemned person. And in the third century, historian Eusebius of Caesarea says, and I quote, their bodies were frightfully lacerated beyond recognition. Christian martyrs in Smyrna were so torn by the scourges that their veins were laid bare. The inner mus muscles and the sinews and even their entrails fell out and became exposed to the crowds of people. In 1986, a American medical journal, this is not theological people. These are not godly people. These are not church going, tithing, casting out demon people. These are lost, for the most part, medical examiners. People that understand medicine, accidents, death, all of that. Quotations from them. From the American Medical Journal. They were asked to employ methodology medicinally and historically to study the ancient manuscripts of the Bible and history to medically describe what a scourging and a crucifixion would look like of this one named Jesus. Quote from the medical example. When the whips would strike the flesh, instead of leaving a nice clean laceration, they would dig deeply into the flesh and they would stay. The flogger would then have to pull the whips out and tore chunks of flesh off with it when it transpired. The whip lashes that you normally think are not what are produced here. Whole sections of flesh are completely torn off of the bone. After several blows, the back would be so shredded that parts of the spine would be exposed. The lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. The sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victims were open to exposure and for all to see. The whippings go from the shoulders, down the back, the buttocks, and to the upper part of the legs. Roman floggings did not consist of 39 lashes as did the Jewish law. Many people died during this horrendous treatment and from this kind of beating before they even made it to crucifixion. At the very least, the person would experience tremendous pain and go into hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock does four things medically to a person's body. Number one, the heart races to try to pump blood that actually isn't there any longer. Number two, the blood pressure drops. I can put my phone down, my hand shaking so bad. The blood pressure drops, causing the person to faint or collapse. Number three, the kidneys stop producing urine to maintain what volume of blood is actually left. Number four, the person becomes very thirsty as the body craves fluids to replace the lost blood volume. Hence, on the cross, Jesus said, I thirst. My tongue, he said in Psalm 22, prophetically cleaveth to my jaws. We'll see in a moment. Having been lifted up on the cross, medical journal, not Greg Locke, not King James Bible. Having been lifted up on the cross, his arms would have been stretched about six feet in length and both shoulders would have become completely dislocated. 
as the arms fatigue great waves of cramps sweep across the muscles knotting them in deep relentless throbbing pain hanging by his arms the pectoral muscles become paralyzed and the intercostal muscles are unable to react crucifixion is literally death by asphyxiation in order to exhale Jesus had to push up on his feet so the tension on his diaphragm and his muscles would be eased for just a moment but by doing this his foot pushed through the spike locking up against the tarsal bone creating incredible amounts of pain also he was scraping his bloodied back bloody back against the coarse wood of a cross as you can imagine what that would produce after exhaling he was able to relax and for a moment take another breath in but again he'd have to push himself back up to exhale all of this just for one single breath this would go on until the person wasn't able to push up and breathe any longer as Jesus slows down his breathing he goes into respiratory acidosis the carbon dioxide in his blood is dissolved into carbonic acid causing the acidity of his blood to rise rapidly this leads to an irregular heartbeat in addition to that the hypovolemic shock would have caused an increased heart rate that contributed to heart failure resulting in pericardial effusion flood around uh, fluid around the heart as well as pleural effusion fluid in the lungs and now it's almost over the loss of tissue fluid has reached a critical level at this point the compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy thick sluggish blood back into the tissues and the tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air while the markedly dehydrated tissues send their flood of stimuli to the brain looking for relief once feeling in the legs is gone Jesus would have been unable to push up in order to breathe and death would occur quickly and remember that's exactly what happened because oftentimes they would come and break the legs of the soldiers but not a bone of him is broken because he was the Passover lamb fulfillment you understand and later in John 19 it says that the soldier came and saw that he was dead already but to make sure he took a spear he thrust it into his side and two things came out water and blood I'm going to circle that thought in a moment and come back to it and explain to you why those two things actually came out. But I want to read one more thing. The Romans used, and you know, a lot of times we have these railroad ties, real thick bottoms. I actually have a physical, masterful representation in my office of what the spike look like from that moment from that time period and it is long it looks much like a railroad nail but it's very thin it's very it doesn't look like you think it would look but here's something interesting I've done hours of study just to cry <laughs> but listen to this this is crazy these five to seven inch spikes were tapped to a fine point and they are I can show you when I got it they were usually driven through the wrist not the hand the wrist was considered part of the hand in Roman times and certainly we know that it was it was thrust right through here that way not a bone of him was broken if you obviously take a spike and run it through somebody's hand you're gonna crush their bone and yet prophetically we know that his bones were not broken but listen if it were placed in his hands the spikes would not hold him because the skin would begin to tear and he would have fallen off the cross a spike through the wrist listen to this would have hit and crushed the median nerve this type of pain medical examiner this type of pain was so beyond description that a new word had to be invented 
that means out of the cross and the only word to describe this level of pain was the word excruciating look it up it's why it's got the phrase crew in it because excruciating was something that was defined as being out of the cross and it was only used in historical context with the crucifixion that's how excruciating the pain was and we say things like oh I stubbed my toe it's so excruciating I've got a mild headache I'm in excruciating pain hmm? I don't minimize you stubbing your toe and having a headache but you better choose your words wisely We rarely will ever experience in life something that excruciating. Now, I want to prove to you from the Old Testament that I didn't make any of that up. So I had to start backwards. I want you to go to two places. Psalm 22. Verse 1, I hear pages turn over for time's sake. Catch me on the fly. Psalm 22, this is a messianic psalm. By the way, I, I say this lovingly, but I say it biblically and boldly. No one of the Jews don't want to take responsibility for what they did to the Messiah. No man was ever treated like this. And that why, that's why in one day, the Bible says, when Jesus returns... It says, a nation shall be born in a day. You know why? They will look upon him whom they have pierced and know the truth that, oh, dear God, we killed our Messiah. But notice Psalm 22. My God, my God. Direct quote, by the way, from the New Testament when he said, again, Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, Oh my God, I cried in the daytime. But thou hearest not. In the night season I am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm. And no man. A reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, and by the way, they said this, direct quote from the New Testament, he trusted on God that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And now... What I just explained from the New Testament and from verifiable medical evidence. Listen to what the Bible says. Verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Here's something we never talk about, we never preach on. But we're delivering church, and you better listen to me right now. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round watch this they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring first peter 5 8 lion now listen to me i don't have time to develop this right now but i'm gonna say it i understand that we have to talk about the physicality of the suffering of jesus because that's what bore the sin of the world but you do realize that the garden proves the emotional, mental distress that he was under before the physical distress 
and destruction of his body. But here's the thing we never think about. We never preach and we never talk about the spiritual attack that he was under. You know, we, we know that there weren't like bulls from the land of Bashan at the foot of the cross with all those people nibbling on Jesus. When he says, many bulls of Bashan have come past me, round about, they gaped upon me with their mouths. In the spirit realm, what the Jews and the Romans couldn't see and what the pictures don't tell you is the demons of hell were swirling around the cross thinking that they had won the victory laughing at him gaping on him with their mouths you sorry wanna be fake messiah we won we won we won la 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 we won our king reigns supreme kick us out of heaven see what happens demons of hell tormenting the son of God you ain't never seen a picture of that let's draw that one as the tormentors of hell laughed him to scorn on a cross while these weak feeble human Romans and Jews shook their little tiny insignificant fist the real scorning was from hell not from beneath the cross standing on a rocky hill and when you sing, Jesus paid it all. You better know he did just that. He didn't just fight the religious system. He literally fought hell by the acre on a cross. As if he had time to think about anything else with all the pain he was going through. And yet those demons laughing and scorning and singing the victory song and taking their victory lap. But you hear me, it would be short lived. It would be a short lap around the track, devil. Checkmate, it'd be a short lap around the track. But they gaped upon him with their mouths. Watch this. I wonder why we don't read this stuff in church. Verse 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Now we know not a bone of him is broken. But you remember what the medical examiner said that his shoulders would be out of joint. His body would have dislocation. It would literally be like trying to nail human jello to a wall. No bone resistance. He says right here, this is a quote messianically from Jesus. All my bones are out of joint. You dislocate a finger, you're jacked up for a while. All of his bones are out of joint. Now watch this. This is, this is interesting. Words mean something. My heart, says Jesus, is like wax. It, his heart, is melted in the midst of his bowels. You know, that's been in the Bible for a long time. And nobody preaches on it. What's the significance? It's huge significance. Because when the Roman soldier took the spear and pierced through the flesh into the heart of Jesus he biblically and medically as we just saw busted the pericardium around the heart of Jesus which is a water sack that is nothing more than a shock absorber that keeps you from going into cardiac arrest when you fall over it keeps you balanced when you trip over a ladder and you hit the ground it's a shock absorber it's a water suppressant. It's around your heart right now. If it weren't, you're dead. And Jesus said, when he died for the sins of the world, that your sin and my sin so broke the heart of God that when the Roman soldier pierced his side and burst the pericardium water sack, he said, now my heart like wax. 
melts into my bowels and from the side of his bowels what came forth water and blood the water proved his death the blood proved his divinity because you ask anybody that's ever worked with dead people I've done more Metro Police Department wrecks in the middle of the night when I had to be the chaplain and go tell that family that their son or their daughter or whoever is dead in a car accident. That is not a fun gig. I got out of it because it wasn't fun. They wouldn't let me be pastoral. You had to be too direct and curt about it. But you know what's interesting? I've walked up on some of the most horrific wreck scenes that Nashville's ever seen in the history of Nashville. There is not a car accident debacle that I have not looked into. Including a 16 year old girl that was hit by a fast and furious speed racer over by Opry Mills at two in the morning going 95 miles an hour and it threw her body 200 yards. 200 yards when I got to the scene I had to take a jacket out of my trunk to cover her because it literally literally blew her clothes off and people were standing around taking pictures of her on the ground God strike me dead if I'm lying she was cut to smithereens died on impact but you know what's interesting because she died on impact the lacerations in her body were humongous but because of immediate death there was no bloodshed coming out of any of those lacerations you could literally move the entire skin cut all the way into the bone and not a drop of blood coming out because dead people don't bleed because your heart stops pumping blood through your body doctors have been amazed that somebody could be standing in their office have a massive heart attack die standing up fall over hit their head on the table gash it open hit the ground and not a drop of blood spill out and yet when Jesus who had been dead for some time got stabbed the only thing that come out was the water and the blood proving that he was dead and he was God he was dead and he was God. And I remind you that Roman soldier began to tremble and he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Even a blind prophet could see it. This guy wasn't a doctor. He had done that a thousand times. He was a professional executioner. And that's one thing he had never seen. And when the blood came out of a dead man's body, he said, holy smokes alive. We've bit off more than we can chew. And the Bible says at that moment, the ground began to shake. But oh, we're not done. Verse 25 my strength is dried up like a potsherd. You, you, you take pottery, once it dries, what does it do? It stiffens, it gets smaller, it, can, it constricts. His body was stiffening up, constricting. Now watch this. And my tongue, remember what we read? Cleaveth to my jaws. He, he literally was so dehydrated. His tongue was cleaving to his jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Literally reads the desert of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Man, they're all there laughing. They pierced my hands and my feet. A nail here, a nail here. Take both feet. Bend this one over the top of that one find the right access point and I studied it and found it just like I did with the rest of it it's a lot to read and take one spike and drive it through both feet at the same time 
And let me remind you, after his resurrection, after his glorification, and after showing himself on a couple of occasions to his disciples, he said to Thomas Didymus, which is the doubter, you write this second, even after my resurrection, can take your hands and stick them into the prints in my feet and in my hands. And I wonder, and I'll not give you lockology and speculate too much, but I wonder if that could not be a biblical representation for the fact that when we get to the kingdom of God, the one thing, the one thing that we will be able to notate for all of eternity are the prints in his hands and his feet. Hmm. So watch this. I, I never paid attention to this. For some reason, I guess it was just one of them. Oh, it's the book of Psalms. It's just poetic structure. Look at verse 17. This Jesus, prophetically speaking, David speaking, obviously, but talking about what was going to happen. He didn't even recognize it. He didn't even prophetically understand it. I may tell all of my bones, they, shout they. The word they is referring to the bones. That's how English language works. They look and stare upon me. Who looks and stares upon you? All those people? No, they're already there. His bones, subject of the sentence, they, the subject, which is the bones, look and stare upon him. There's only one way bones look at you. And that's when you've been so filleted open that the skin's been punctured, the muscles have been ruptured. And we say, oh man, whew, that hurts all the way to the bone. Yep. Yep. Jesus was so unbelievably ribboned with the lacerations of a scourging device that upon the scourging, no wonder Pilate says, surely they're going to be a peace. Behold, what is left of a man? Goodness, look at this. But they weren't happy. And people still aren't happy. And they hang him up and he says, I am so brutally wounded and violently treated that the openings in my flesh give opportunity for my bones to stare at me and mock him as it were. My bones look and they stare upon me. Now I want you to go one more place. Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. Just for a moment. Isaiah 52 is the obvious introduction into Isaiah 53 we have chapter divisions they had scrolls on hide okay we came in and we put the chapter divisions in there because it made it easier for memorization historically there were no original chapter divisions in the Bible it was a scroll copy it was written one particular continuous fluid way right so the end of chapter 52 sets the stage for the beginning of chapter 53 look at verse 13 he's referring to the Messiah you can go back, you can study and challenge all of this. It's, it's in the Bible. I don't have time to, to preach expositionally on all of this because there's, there's a lot here. <clears throat> Isaiah is predicting the coming Messiah to the Jewish nation. He says in verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Now listen, when Isaiah stood to say this to the Jewish nation, he said, when the Messiah comes, he's going to be extolled and be exalted and be very high. And they're like, "Woo! amen, hallelujah, hip, hip, hooray. But the amen's right up the next verse. 
as many were astonished at thee. Watch this. His visage, his facial features, the physical, the physical characteristics of his visible body. Watch this. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form than the sons of men. Did you catch that? His face was unrecognizable as a human. Because all the gospels tell us what they did even before and after the scourging. They buffeted him. Who hit you, prophet? Hit him in the face with their fists. Smacked him in the mouth with their bare hands. Cleared their throats. And spit phlegm in his face. He said, I gave my, my back to the smiters. The smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Fistfuls of hair in his beard. Just <laughs> rip it out. Hmm? Pluck an eyelash. See how that does for you. Pull on your eyebrow. Get a dangling nose hair. Let somebody grab your face with a fistful of your beard and rip it out from the roots. And Isaiah, under Holy Ghost inspiration, said, Oh, you want to see your Messiah? You're not going to like him too much when you see him because he'll be unrecognizable as a human because you're going to beat him without mercy. And his form, the rest of his body, more what? More marred, he just said it, than the sons of men. Think you've seen some bad accidents? You never seen nothing like this. No man ever been this opened up. No man ever been beat this brutally, this ridiculously, this much without mercy and restraint. Because again, it was a crooked Roman government that was doing this to appease crooked Jewish politicians and religious church-going wannabe folks. It was the high priest that was mad. Let that sink in. You read the Old Testament? High priest? He's the president of spirituality and he hated Jesus. And religion hates Jesus today just as much as it did 2,000 years ago and it spits in his face. And the Bible says his face and his body was just emaciated. Verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. They didn't like that. What do you mean? He's going to do this for many nations? No, it's just us. No, you better be glad you got grafted in. The king shall shut their mouths at him for that which had not been told them shall they see and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Watch this. He then has to ask this question because it was so unbelievable. Who hath believed our report? <laughs> What he just told them about the predictive coming of the Messiah was so unbelievable. It was so against what they thought that he said, you don't even believe this. Who hath believed our report? Oh, it could be a whole other message, but let me just say this. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. I remind you that there had been silence from God for 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. And that's why in Matthew 3 and verse 1 it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven has come. And it was the first message in 400 years that God spoke through somebody. And Israel was dry like a parched piece of leather. And out of that dryness came forth the root of Jesse. Out of the dry grew the Messiah. He hath no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, look at this, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He, he told the Jews what I'm telling you right now. Y'all been looking at too many pictures. He said, when you see him, you won't even like him. Let me tell you how common Jesus was. You ready for this? Buckle up. 
Jesus was so common that people who already met him in the synagogue and the marketplace had to be told who he was at midnight in a garden by one of his friends to kiss him. So stop thinking that Jesus was floating around, angel wings coming out of his back and a halo over his head. He was so common. He looked like your neighbor. And the only way the people knew who he was is for one of his own to say, hey, uh, I'm going to tell you who he is. I'm going to kiss him. That's how common he was. You see, when you're looking for the wrong person, you won't recognize the right person when it shows up. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. We just, he was despised, we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now, you know what that means? You used to have a hard time wondering, what does that mean? Here's what it means. It means he did all this for us. At first, he did it for the Jews. You understand that? Because he came into his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. John 1, 11 and 12. But he said, look, I did this for you. But here's what the Jews said. Oh, he deserved it. He's smitten of God. He's cursed of God. So watch this. Verse 5. But he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. Notice it does not say for his. He was bruised for our iniquities. The, Luke uses this word, chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his, notice please this next word, stripes lacerations blood filled furrows and with his stripes we are healed spiritually and physically with his stripes with the furrows in his back his legs his torso his arms his neck hinder parts by his stripes multiple we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him Jesus the iniquity of us all he was oppressed he was afflicted he opened not his mouth now watch this if you think I'm being fantastical look what the Bible calls it he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter He looked like he had gone through a meat packing plant. He was butchered like a lamb to the slaughter. And some of y'all want a patty cake with some dead church that wants to take the blood out of the hymn books because that's too offensive. Well, you know, I don't know about that old-fashioned slaughterhouse religion. You go to hell without the slaughterhouse religion. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He went to the slaughter for us. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened it not his mouth. That proves he's God right there. I'd open my mouth a thousand times. In one verse, he was taken from prison, from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because, because he was wicked? No, because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now look at me for a second. I'm just going the way in the flow the Holy Spirit tells me to go. We've come all this way, right? Come all this way. Been a good journey. And I don't have time to explain, explore, and expositionally somehow try to get us to wrap our mind around what comes next. All of that. 
every bit of it. And crazy enough, if I can reverently say it that way, look what verse 10 says. Yet, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. What? Do you know why? It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus because it displeased the Lord to have to bruise you because he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and the God of heaven with a wrath filled frown of sovereign justification Look down at the darkness and the pitiful, vile, violent, disgusting scene at Golgotha, just outside Jerusalem proper. And when God saw it, he turned his frown upside down, and God said, That'll do, son. That'll do. And that's why 1 John says in chapter 4 and verse 4, He is the propitiation. The satisfaction of the wrath of God for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And God was pleased. I got two things I want to talk about, two things I want to show you. Let me have my, uh, my tool, if I can get that. <laughs> Sir. I went on a long historical journey in preparation of this dreaded message. <laughs> now, lest you think I'm holding styrofoam, This is heavy. I found a man that is the only authentic Roman flagrum maker that we can find on the planet. This man spent his life studying history. Now listen to me. It's funny, and I hate to, to mess up some of your Sunday school theology. But it's funny how easily tradition creeps into the things that we say, even as preachers. You know, we use that phrase all the time. Well, Jesus was beat with a cat of nine tails. Read that in the Bible. You'll find it nowhere in the Bible. Do you know the cat of nine tails was not effectively and efficiently used until the 1700s by the British? You know why it's called a cat of nine tails? Because it was used as a form of punishment, not a form of chastisement and scourging. It's called cat of nine tails because it scratches you like a cat. And our whole evangelical world, Jesus was beat with a cat of nine tails. Jesus, no he wasn't. Bible never says that. Matter of fact, the cat of nine tails has nothing to do with what I'm holding in my hand right now. It's interesting that the cat of nine tails is so overlooked and so dismissed by historians that I would suggest you don't even look it up. Because when you do, the cat of nine tails is so foo-foo frilly, it's been adopted by the LGBTQIA world as a sex toy. And we're going to go around with our false theology thinking Jesus got beat by a sex toy. Help me, Holy Ghost. Jesus was beat by a Roman flagrum. This is a flagrum. Some have three, some have nine, some have twelve. 
Those are lead balls embedded on the bottom of the leather frame straps. Real rope, real wood. And that's real nails in the bottom of that. Matter of fact, they're, they're, they're so real, you wouldn't even... Brother Paul, t touch him right there. Tell me if I'm lying. J -j just touch him nails right there. Tell me, this is a replica. You can feel that, can't you? I wouldn't want my grandson swinging this at my foot. It's heavy. I mean, it's heavy. C can you imagine? Feel how heavy that is, brother. And they, they come over the top. Bam. It gets stuck in there and rip it out. Big hunks and chunks of flesh coming out of Jesus. And we got these silly little notions. They brush whipped him with a broom. Look at that. I showed this to Jules the other day. He's like, man, I wouldn't want somebody to hit my hand with that one time. Not even a little bit. Not even barely. That's what he was beat with. That's the closest historical, accurate representation of what Jesus was beat with. And by the way, the guy that made it gave kudos to Mel Gibson, said he was the most historically accurate person in any movie that's ever been made about Jesus when he did The Passion of Christ, which he's working on part two right now about the resurrection. Because he ain't dead no more. Hallelujah for that. <laughs> now, I just, I want to give you a visible understanding. Okay, regardless of, of what happens from this moment moving forward, I need you to understand what the Bible describes about the, the gruesome nature of what happened to Jesus. So you're going to have to get a vivid look at it. Does that make sense? Is that okay? I need you to, to see. I can't, I can't recreate it. I'm not the replica man. I, no, that's not what I'm doing. I, I want you to see with your eyes something that we're afraid to look at with our heart. So bring it out here, fellas, if you would, just for a moment. Just I want them to see the, the physicality of, of what it looks like inside a person's body. This is an FBI grade dummy. We had it built just so you could see it for this message. For this message, we had the whole thing built. Took two weeks to build it and get it here. I might need y'all to stay here just for a second if you would, because I want them to see something. So I told them, I said, uh, I want the whole spinal column in it, shoulder blades, all of it. Now I want you to spin it around for me. Feel the spin on there. I said, I want our people to be able to see what somebody's insides look like. FBI grade. Thank you. Governmentally certified. Ballistic bullet body. For lack of better terminology. And although we can see through the clarity of the skin, the Bible says that Jesus' skin was so open. That his bones stared at him. And we come to church, bored the moment we walk through the door, sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. But by Monday morning, this time, nobody believes you. We didn't practice nothing. We didn't try to replicate anything. All I know is this is a heavy flagrum with some lead balls and nails in the bottom of it. We found this little guy right here. I don't even know if it'll work. But the Bible says that They've strapped Jesus to that pole. 
And in a laughing, gruesome, almost sarcastic, evil display. Not even going through the amount of force that they would have used to beat his body. They laid Jesus up against that pole and started right there on his back. On his shoulders. Them chunks coming out. Backbone sticking through. Come around the front. Flavius said that when they would open it up, that it would literally, that gash, it would literally allow his bowels to fall out. Now, I'm not going to do it like they would do it. I'm not trying to be violent. I'm trying to be visual. And they would literally take that and they would whip Jesus right in the middle. Can you imagine the the tingling sensation when you hit your funny bone? It's never funny. They renamed it. Named it wrong. Imagine when your ribs get hit with a flagrum. See the gash in the back of this thing's neck. I'm not going to make it spill out all over the ground. This thing's heavy enough to do it. But I wonder, why is it that we can hear this, we can see this, and we can still say things like this? Well, you know that Greg Locke? He got in there by reading their Bible in a whole month. Who's he think he is? He says he's going to read his Bible three times. Who's he think he is? Well, you know, I know I ain't been to church in a month. I'll get around to it. Yeah, I know I treat my family like garbage. Treat my wife like a dog. Did I hear you say I had to give 10% of my income to Jesus? What kind of tyrant do you think he is? Hmm? Well, nobody knows I'm looking at it every night. Ain't no big deal. My wife don't know. My kids don't know. Preacher don't know. I ain't hurting nobody. You see? We are so weak in American Christianity. I want to be free from my addiction, preacher. But give me six more months. I enjoy it too much. Don't tell me I got to fast. Don't tell me I got to pray. Don't tell me I got to be faithful to church. You're radical, Greg Locke. Your political views are just far too right. Maybe far too right just for wicked people. But that's what you don't see. That's the literal undercloak behind the scenes. And Jesus bled out for us. No wonder. In Revelation, Jesus in red letter says, You make me sick. You make me 
Isaac. You're lukewarm, anemic, schizophrenic, casual approach to Christianity makes me sick. He gave it all. You think he did that so we could just sit around and criticize him? Ignore him? It's easy to act like something that happened 2,000 years ago never happened and impacted us so much. Jesus is still the most controversial and influential figure in the history of the human race and forevermore will be. One Jewish man with 12 rednecks and one was demon-possessed. No formal education. Born in such a weird, off-scouring place that they said, nothing good comes out of that man's area. No good from that neighborhood. This can't be him. That man who for three and a half, barely, years Preach the most controversial sermons the world has ever heard. Read Matthew 23. You'll find it to be true. Saw multitudes follow him momentarily. And when they arrest him in a garden, they all forsook him and fled. Even the ones that had walked with him for the whole three and a half years. One trying to get away so emphatically, he took his robe off. And the Bible says that he ran through the garden buck naked trying to get away and I don't know I wish it were possible to maybe visualize it in, in, in ways that we never have see it in ways that we've never seen it but I don't know that it's I, I don't know that me preaching this I don't know that, that, that any Hollywood rendition nothing will do it Favorable justice. Nothing. But the Bible's pretty plain. He could see his own bones. Do you know why? They found a man named Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross for at least a lengthy portion of the trip because he is under so much physical, spiritual, mental and emotional pain that fatigue has so set into his muscles that there is no way that he could carry what is actually historically called the patabulum. They carried the top part of the cross. The other part was already there in the hole in the ground. And they would carry that patabulum. They would take it up there, pull that cross out of the hole, that stick out of the hole, lay it down, nail it to it and put it back in the hole that had already been made for the cross. They knew it fit because it was already there. They only carried the top part, 300 pounds. To the ground he went. To the ground he went. And this precious black man named Simon of Cyrene comes by and they said, Hey, uh, son of Rufus, come here. Pick up this man's cross carrot. There were actually six different types of crosses in Roman crucifixion. But the most horrendous of all the crucifixions was not when they just had a T-shaped cross or even a regular shaped cross or a cross, shape, an X-shaped cross, which, by the way, is what Peter was crucified on upside down. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. It'll make you want to go bear hunting with a switch. But the most cruel form was after they had whipped them without mercy, they would place that patabulum, that 300-pound cross beam on their back, try to make them carry it between their shoulders, and the Bible says that in his humanity he falls to the ground and Simon carries it for him. How long he carried it, we don't know. But we know that when he got to the top of the hill, John said, and Jesus was bearing it himself. So he carried it, dropped it, had it carried, and carried it the rest of the way. But when the women came, they, they saw this emaciated flesh of a man crawling like an animal up this little path. It's a little more of a road now, but it was basically a pig path in. And they began to weep. They began to cry. The Bible says that they fell down and they began to howl. And they, oh, look at what's going on. Oh, they just were broken. 
Their emotions were all over the place. And Jesus stopped them. Remember that? In the midst of everything they saw, and Jesus said, Don't weep for me. Weep for your children. Because they don't even understand what I'm doing. That's who you weep for. They carried him up there. Nailed him. Thief here. Thief there. Righteous Jesus. Son of God. God the Son. Middle cross. Reviled by many. Fighting demons. And of all the things he could converse about. He says. Father. Forgive them. Forgive them. These weak, powerless, sinful, rebellious creatures of dirt. Forgive them. They're just ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. I thirst. And then finally, when it was all said and done, and the stewarding angels of heaven were going to historically jot down the record that would forever change the world. You see, what those angels were used to hearing was 4,000 years of an endless cycle of a religious sacrificial system that only covered somebody's sin for a year. And all those angels knew was the continual bloodshed of the Old Testament sacrificial system. And at times it was so big that the altar could not receive the burnt offerings. So says the Bible in multiple places. And I can imagine, here's all these angels. Quiet as a church mouse. Darkness has fallen upon the earth. An earthquake is about to begin. The veil in the temple is about to be rent from top to bottom, showing you that it wasn't man that did it, but God did it for man. And here I can see them. That angelic scribe, he's waiting for it. This is going to be good. This is the conclusionary moment. 4,000 years brings us to this. By the way, I can say they talk like that because you know what Hebrew says? Hebrew says they don't even understand salvation. They peer in wishing they had what we've got. And about the time that faithful servant of the Lord with his golden pen in hand gets ready to write, Jesus simply says, It is finished. What's finished? The sacrificial system. That for 4,000 years served as a constant reminder of the judgment of God. It is done. No more blood will have to be shed. No more lambs, rams, Bullocks, turtle doves, pigeons, it's done. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the patriarch of the Old Testament, it's done. Nobody else has to die. It's done. And here's what he does the Bible says he bows his head. And he gave up the ghost because no man took it from him. He said in John 10, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. 
So that's a long way around the barn this morning. Long way around the barn. But needed. Descriptive, but probably not enough. Graphic, gruesome. Probably gave you about 10% of what the Bible really says. If we were to see it. And I don't know as to whether God will ever allow us to see it in the eons of eternity. But whatever it looked like, it pleased God. And it satisfied wrath that all of us deserved. All of us. And God says, okay, it's done. It's finished. It's over with. Goes in the ground. Three days. Whole message in Ephesians 3 on what happened during those three days. He's resurrected upon the first day of the week. As he said that he was going to be. He appears for 40 days several different times to his disciples and many others. And then in Acts chapter 1, he stands on a hillside. He gives a commission to his disciples. And the Bible says when he gave that commission, that he was caught up before them into the clouds. And he was received immediately out of their sight. Then two men in white apparel stood amongst them and said, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which ye see rising into heaven shall so come again in like manner as ye have seen him go. Get down to Jerusalem. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. And use the most brutal message on the face of the planet to turn the world upside down. And they did. And 2,000 years removed... We're still here talking about it. We're still here talking about it. So the next time you feel like giving him your leftovers, be remind you, be reminded that the heart of heaven was cut out, sent to this earth. God gave us his best and then some and how dare we how dare we give him anything less than our best so from this moment this second in this room and online from this second I have no interest at all in pastoring people that are not fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ Hear me? So I think it's right to simply tell you as a shepherd either fully surrender everything to Jesus or find a church that will let you live in non-surrender. But this one's not it. This one's not it. So I've circled the airport for a while, but I've got to say one thing. I'm done. You know, this Bible reading we've been doing got me tore up. I never read so much Bible. And I like it. It's fun. I'm mashing the gas whether you do it or not. You know, sometimes we... We read things so out of context that it's almost just like silly to us. 
I'm not, again, I'm not trying to mess up your Sunday school growing up. To some degree, some of it needs to be messed up. <laughs> There's a little chorus sometimes that, that we sing, and it's a great chorus. I love it. Okay? And I'm not, not necessarily going to sing it. But we grew up, all of us grew up singing this. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We all sing that. In the same context that that verse is mentioned, there's another verse that says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Sometimes we use that verse, we'll come to a situation like this, we're like, wow, this is the Lord's doing. Look what the Lord's doing. But then I began to study and I began to realize why those two verses were written in the Bible. And I was shocked at my own ignorance. Because, yeah, I know this is the day that the Lord... Yeah, I get it. But that's not what it means. Did you know that was a messianic prophecy? For the brutality that we just dealt with in the Bible? And the psalmist in the spirit saw what I just described and the psalmist said this is the day that the Lord hath made let us rejoice and be glad in it for this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes and you have an appointment with an altar this morning Stand to your feet. It's time to use it right now. Come on. Come on. Half-hearted Christianity is done. Those days are numbered. That ship has sailed. What's coming next in this nation and around the world and for the church of the living God is only going to be survived by serious saints of God. Thank Him today. Worship Him. Weep before Him. Oh, He's worthy. I'm so limited in how I can describe how worthy He is. I'm so limited in how I can illustrate what He's done for us. But the next time you see perhaps a more visual picture Perhaps when you read now Psalm 22, John 19, Isaiah 53, maybe then at that moment you can say, Oh yeah, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice. And be glad in it. And be glad in it.
If you're here today and you're going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism and after a message like this, if you've been saved but you've never been water baptized, you need to get your heart right. Just slip over to my right, your left. Miss Billy and the crew will get over there. and We'll get you a towel, get you a name tag. But you take your time at this altar. If you're here today and you've never truly been saved, you've never repented and believed the gospel, you've never been born again, you get down here and let somebody show you from the Bible what it means to be a Bible Christian, what it means to believe on Jesus. You, you can hear a tear-jerking sermon and still bust hell wide open. Jesus died for the sins of the world, but you've got to appropriate what he did for you. You've got to accept what he did for you. And if you need to get born again, you get down here, sir. You get down here, man. We'll talk to you. We'll pray with you. Just lay it all down. Surrender it all to Him. Give it all over. Take as long as you need. The team's just going to sing a little bit. We're going to worship. This is a worship service. I'm going to move over to the baptismal tank for baptisms. We don't dismiss. We just say, We'll see you the next service. You can stay as long as you need. Slip out if you need to. If you want to come up here and see your friends and family that are getting baptized, it'll be on the screens as well, the live stream. Men will be meeting in the morning, 6 a.m. Doesn't seem too early anymore, does it? Doesn't seem too cold anymore. 6 o'clock in the morning, we'll have our men's Bible study. Wednesday night we'll have our service don't forget 4 o'clock today volunteer opportunity evening 4 o'clock get here after a message like this wow who wouldn't want to use your gifts in the local church serve the bride of Christ so tonight 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock be here for that but again if you're going to be baptized just go ahead and slip over you worship as long as you want pray as long as you want get around hug each other be safe. We'll see the next service. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. Team's going to lead us.
And I thought my time had ran out But now I'm ready to life again Cause you were finished with me Alright Brother Lucas, my brother in the Lord Upon your public your confession glory. of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ The power of his gospel and your willingness to serve him Gives me a great honor to baptize you in the name of the so Father, Son, and the Holy glory. Spirit Bear to baptism Raised to walk and do this alive, baby it was all for your glory. It was all for your glory. All right, Brother Ronnie, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel, it gives me a great honor, sir, to baptize you before these witnesses in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit in baptism. Raised to walk and notice a life. I am should die. Let your name be lifted high. There is no one else like you. Worthy is the King of Kings, clothed in all your majesty. Everything belongs to you. All right, Sister Michelle, upon your public confession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power and glory of his gospel, gives me a great honor before these witnesses and before the Lord to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Mary, to baptism. Praise to walk and then it's a life. Sister Jordan, upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel, gives me a great honor before these witnesses to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary, to baptism, raised to walk, and there is a All right, Elizabeth, upon your public profession of faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel, it gives me a great honor today to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear to baptism, raise to walk, and then it's in life. Of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> hey, Jesus, upon your public confession of faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power and glory of his gospel, it gives me a great honor, my dear brother, to baptize you today before these witnesses. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in baptism. 
Raised to walk in newness of life.